I'd like to introduce Ben Wolfson, who will be moderating our PowerPoint presentations and the rest of the sessions. Ben got his PhD in molecular medicine with a focus in cancer biology from the University of Maryland, Baltimore. He is now a postdoc in cancer immunotherapy at the National Cancer Institute. And he has a long-standing interest in science policy and advocacy, including publishing multiple op-eds and articles in social media and online. Ben is currently also an associate editor at the journal Science Policy and Governance and also runs a blog at the NIH Science Policy Discussion Group, which is called Science Policy for All, and I'll share this um, in the chat. Ben? Great, thanks for that introduction. Um, I just wanna mention that, like Adriana said, I'm a member of JSPG, but I've seen some of the questions floating in about how to get involved. You know, when I was in grad school, my university didn't have a science policy group. And so my friends and I started a science policy group. And we were able to meet with our representatives just by cold emailing them and setting up um, setting up meetings. And so it's definitely accessible to you. Uh, you just kind of have to reach for it. So with that, um, and with those great introductions, we're gonna get to our panel and do a bit of a deeper dive into uh, the areas of expertise that we've got here. So we're gonna start with Sarah Marriott. Sarah is currently a PhD candidate at George Mason University, uh, researching small scale fisheries in the Philippines. Prior to starting her PhD, she worked as an observer on pelagic long line vessels as a contractor for NOAA. Uh, Sarah then worked on the Fish Forever program run by the international NGO RARE, which led to her research interests in how community-based management impacts fish ecology and fishing yield. She was recently awarded a Boren Fellowship to support her research and is also a CSYNC fellow working on incorporating social metrics, metrics into offshore uh, aquaculture siting in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal research since I'm currently um, studying and I'm a little bit removed from the active uh, policy making and involvement uh, policy communication realm, um, at least in the United States. Uh, most of my research is in uh, based in the Philippines at the moment. So with that, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about stakeholder engagement in fishery research policy. And so just to give a brief introduction of what fisheries are because not everybody might know that. I'm going to bring you guys through a problem that I personally work on. And so fisheries are, you know, just a um, defined by a fish, like uh, by a species or a gear type. So you can have a trawl fishery or like a shrimp fishery. And it's really an important industry because 59 million people work with it. Um, and so it supports a lot of livelihoods as well as it helps feed the, the world. Um, and it's made up of both aquaculture and marine capture. But over the last um, couple decades, marine capture has uh, fallen flat at about uh, 90 uh, million tons. And there's this problem that we have been overfishing the ocean. So how, what policies do we have in place and what science are we using to create those policies to sort of solve this problem of overfishing? And um, having effective management, so effective policies are very important. Um, and I study uh, a little bit about the impact of these different policies. And when we think of overfishing, uh, we tend to think of images like this, right? So big nets, lots of fish, people on large boats, um, scooping up millions of tons of fish, right? However, what about a scenario like this? That's just one man on a boat, doing his thing, fishing, right? But, and so what type of policies do we have that involve this type of fishermen? And we might not think this is a big deal. However, there's 37 million small scale fishers. So when you scale up um, that one individual fisher, you then end up with this problem of overfishing. And small scale fisheries actually can um, 
can result in about 50% of global capture, and it's not always um, accounted for in science. Uh, so we can't really uh, solve this problem of overfishing and have effective fishing policies without addressing this other type of fishery, which is what I do. So what is fisheries policy? And um, some of you might have heard about uh, or learned about policy analyses already. And typically when we write policy analyses, um, we tend to look at these four different sectors. So public opinion or stakeholders, uh, the economic feasibility, political will, and science and technology. And we balance all of these different sectors and create this innovative solution and or a policy solution. And so my particular research really uh, centers around pulling stakeholder engagement and public opinion at the forefront of policy solutions. So uh, making sure that the people uh, are wanting these solutions and are advocating for these solutions themselves. And so I encountered these different types of challenges. And in the US, uh, we have really good, strong fishery policy, and they, they tend to surround these top-down approaches where um, you're taking like a total allowable catch, so you can only fish a certain amount, and then after that, the fishery is closed. And that works really well in uh, areas that have high levels of enforcement, but it doesn't work well uh, in developing nations. Uh, there's also a lack of community support in a lot of fisheries. So because you can be seen as attacking someone's livelihood by reducing the amount of fish they are allowed to catch, there's a lot of, um, of trust issues between science, uh, between scientists, between policymakers, and uh, the community themselves. So getting everybody on board there is really important. Um, and sometimes there's this science policy mismatch where you have a time lag between either um, conclusive scientific evidence and policy needs. So um, sometimes the science might not be clear yet, but they want to implement something right away, or sometimes the science is very clear and policy just takes a long time to implement. Um, so both of those situations occur. And um, I mentioned, uh, I study this people side, right? So a lot of times um, when we think of policy, we really go straight to government. And we think what uh, policies or legislation we can write that is just straight from congressman's mouth, right? But um, I tend to work a lot lower on the policy development um, scale, as it were, where I um, really am interested in how uh, communities can manage themselves and what policies communities can self uh, can implement themselves and self-regulate uh, that will then eventually make its way back up into the government so it's much more uh, grassroots and uh, I find so I work uh, with an NGO called rare and they uh, I use their data set that they've been collecting over the last um, seven years in order to study the uh, effectiveness of these community-based programs. And if these community-based programs can be a, can be sufficient enough policy um, to, to replace, you know, a top-down approach. And so a success from it is that it really, by focusing on uh, stakeholder engagement, you really build this trust between, uh, between groups, uh, between the, you know, scientists and the communities themselves. 
So finally, um, uh, when we really talk about science policy, the people side can be really messy. Uh, it's hard to quantify or determine the weight of the a weight the weight that a certain audience should have in the conversation. Uh, but it's really important in getting that social science side into the policy process because sometimes when we're thinking about our policy and analysis, um, we tend to weight these different sectors uh, differently. So I really believe that incorporating uh, the social science of a community, uh, of community trust uh, management and stakeholder involvement is really um, imperative to successful policy development because if you don't have stakeholder buy-in, a policy isn't gonna be successful. And sometimes having those conversations with community members can actually lead to better policies uh, in the long run. So for example, in the shrimp fishery in the United States, we have turtle excluder devices that are installed, that are implemented on all shrimp trawls. And those were um, designed by fishermen themselves. So uh, having these conversations as scientists and building trust within these communities is really important into bringing that information forward into policy making. So, and then um, to circle back, like I said, I work with this NGO's data set. And as a student um, and as an academic, finding uh, funding to gather some of this science is very expensive, um, especially as a student. Uh, so as just advice for um, students, I think that uh, you really should look at trying to partner with some NGOs or other groups that have these big data sets that aren't doing anything with them. Uh, or have finished what they were originally doing because sometimes you can ask new questions and find new solutions with these data sets that where the original purpose wasn't what you're looking at. Um, so with that, I think that's all I have. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah, that was great. <laughs>